Hey Epifare, this week was my birthday and check out what I got. My studio mates, including Kilian from I Know Review, built me this really cool all-in-one film stand with custom 3D printed stuff, adjustable arms and more. How cool is that? Happy birthday to me and welcome to the Friday checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, for my first story of the week, Qualcomm announced that its new upcoming chips for PCs will be called Snapdragon X. These are going to launch on the 24th of October in Hawaii, and just like Apple's custom-designed M-series CPUs, Snapdragon X will feature Qualcomm's long-awaited custom CPUs called Orion. This was designed by Nuvia, which Qualcomm bought back in January 2021, and the Nuvia people were from Apple, who previously designed Apple's incredibly performant CPUs, so the hopes are high that Snapdragon X can finally give real competition to Apple's M-series chips on Windows. Rumors say that Qualcomm is working on three different processors in the X series and benchmarks that have found their way to Geekbench 6 already seem to show encouraging performance, but Qualcomm itself is not being shy either and is talking about groundbreaking and incredibly powerful and efficient devices. And rumors are that while PC makers in the past have mostly skipped Qualcomm chips and Windows on ARM as a platform, the new chip has them convinced and so brands like HP, Dell and Lenovo are all supposedly going to come out with their Qualcomm powered computers soon. That's encouraging and we actually expect the first PCs with these chips to come out in 2024 already, so I fully expect to see actual laptops at least being teased in Hawaii already. Now the question of course is whether A, the chips will be as good as the rumors say they will be, and B, whether Windows on ARM will finally catch up. After all, Apple launched with almost perfect software emulation for its M series chip right out of the gate and aggressively transitioned its whole Mac platform to the M series very swiftly, but Windows has mostly been fumbling around for years. Anyway, I would personally love to switch back to Windows, especially on a Surface-like form factor, if the battery life and the performance can be as good as it is on my MacBook, so fingers crossed. Okay, and for my second story of the week, the hold of Apple on teenagers, especially in the US, has reached some pretty crazy levels. As far back as 2012, a regular survey has been running, which polls thousands of teens every year, and the results have been staggering. Back in 2012, about 48% of them owned an iPhone. By 2014, that number was up to 60%. It rose to more than three quarters by spring of 2017. Then Apple hit 87% teen ownership in 2021, and that figure actually managed to stay the same in the last report, while 88% of teens actually said that their next phone will be an iPhone 2. That is an insane trend for the future of smartphone competition. The entire next generation, all on iPhones, at least in the US. Now, moving past just the teens and just the US, things get a little bit more nuanced with a new report from Counterpoint. Still, even globally, the top 10 best-selling smartphones are now more dominated than ever by Apple, while Samsung comes in a distant second, and Xiaomi is not even on the top 10 list anymore, like it was last year. Samsung still has a larger overall share, just spread out over more device models, but Apple's share and dominance is actually growing. And fun fact, since iMessage is such an important lock-in in the US, Samsung actually joined Google in trying to publicly shame Apple on RCS, which is causing the whole green and blue bubble issue in countries like the US. Okay, and for my third story of the week, the Taxman is coming, except this time it's for multiple tech giants. So to begin with, this week Microsoft announced receiving a $28.9 billion tax bill, hilariously called a quote proposed adjustment from the IRS for intercompany transfer pricing, aka corporate tax avoidance, between 2004 and 2013. That's an adjustment that even a company the size of Microsoft will feel because it's actually four full months of their profits. Microsoft wrote a blog post explaining that no, 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 they totally properly paid everything, thank you very much, but the two will now fight it out and let's see who's actually right. I think this is like the ultimate final boss fight in accounting and tax advisory, and it's going to be a crazy battle of spreadsheets. In more tax evasion news, India also kept pressing phone maker Vivo, who is now accused of money laundering almost $13 billion or more than a trillion rupees for five years of their operations, with 30 staff implicated and at least four people arrested. Yikes, and beyond just individual countries doing their thing, we also have systemic change coming for the tech giants. Remember how 
a couple of years ago, the OECD countries were talking about harmonizing their corporate tax rates. So tax havens, like for example, Ireland would stop becoming a thing for tech giants, for example. Well, apparently this week, that plan took a major step forward with the agreement finally getting coded into all the right tax language to become an international treaty. A few countries like India are still in conversation about their local laws versus these new ones, but it looks like most of them might just be willing to sign on to it. And if they do, that means that tax constructs like the Dutch sandwich or the double Irish with a Dutch sandwich, <laughs> those would apparently stop working. Claims are that the various companies would start paying between $17 billion and $32 billion more in taxes per year, closer to where they actually make and spend their money. I mean, it's either that or the companies find a new loophole. We'll see. Okay, and now on to the brief, which we start with Starlink, which debuted a Starlink direct to sell page with the tagline seamless access to text, voice and data for LTE phones across the globe. And the core idea, if I understand this correctly, is that they will be beaming cellular connectivity to smartphone that we own right now from space starting in 2024. I mean, you know, timelines are a pretty unreliable thing when they come from Elon, but that actually sounds pretty enticing. Next, Google's fight against Sonos in a court ended up with a Google win and Google immediately restoring Google Home features like grouping smart speakers, which were previously said to be violating Sonos' patents. Google was so pleased that it then also also trashed Sonos in a blog post. Nice. Then in weird news, Cloudflare, Google, Microsoft and Amazon all said this week that they successfully mitigated what they called the largest DDoS attacks ever because of a new vulnerability, reaching a crazy peak of 398 million requests per second at Google, over 200 million per second at Cloudflare and similar numbers at Amazon and Microsoft. That is wild. And also this week, we learned that Huawei does indeed seem to be on a sort of comeback path. First, it has been stockpiling components, including apparently lenses, camera sensors, PCBs, and more to deliver as many as 70 million phones in 2024. And second, at the same time, Huawei's car efforts are paying dividends too. Their car co-venture called, I guess, Series, which is now making an SUV, received 50,000 pre-orders in China, in part because it was demoed in Huawei stores, where the company's domestic popularity is rubbing off on the car. Car. And moving on, the problematic Arm China now has some new problems because a bunch of its senior people, including the head of R&D, have left to join a Chinese chip startup with the Shenzhen government's backing. The startup says that they're not doing anything shady, just regular chip design stuff, but of course the concern is that they might be building a sort of competitor to Arm using the Arm IP. And in big AI news, we learned that apparently OpenAI is making a hundred million dollars in revenue per month now, which is a massive increase. And Adobe also announced a ton of new AI tools, including the ability to upscale old low resolution videos and GIFs, and also the ability to have generative AI for videos right in Premiere Pro, which is pretty crazy. Adobe's voice AI and their Photoshop AI are the two AI tools that I personally use the most in my work, and so I feel like Adobe is on a bit of a roll here. And if you, like me, are fascinated by all these AI advances and want to learn how things like large language models, for example, work, then I have some good news. Brilliant has just added a whole course called How LLMs Work, and this is a great way to get a real deep and technical understanding of the new AI magic that is changing the world. There are eight lessons in this course that start from simple instructions to to images and text generation, to more complex concepts like tokenization. And as usual with Brilliant, the magic is that the course is designed to be as interactive as possible. Each step is explained very clearly and then practiced right away, so you get a real deep understanding and actually manage to retain it. Brilliant has similarly great courses on a ton of other STEM topics, from maths to computer science, physics, biology, and more. And whether you want to learn how to build cool stuff yourself, or you just want to brush up on long forgotten skills, Brilliant is is a great place to go. Their interactive design is not just way more fun than simply reading a book or watching a video. It also switches your brain from a passive mode into an actively participating one, so you retain knowledge a lot more effectively. You can get a 30-day free trial at brilliant.org slash TFC, and the first 200 people who sign up using that link also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So check them out, happy learning, and I'll see you next Friday.